Okay, we're going to do a quick overview of time series and time series tools in R. So when we talk about time series data, there's a couple of features we need to consider. First of all, time series observations are given on economic units observed over time. Okay, so what we're looking at is in general one individual or one thing that we're observing, one subject, and over multiple time periods. And that leads us to the second part, the time series has this natural ordering. So it's ordered over time. And that's very, very important. We have to preserve that ordering. Um, there's also the potential for a dynamic relationship to exist between variables. In other words, we can have past values of variables affecting today. So if I look at what inflation was yesterday, that may well have a causal um, influence over what inflation is today. And we could talk about that more in terms of the, the macroeconomic theory. But for right now, what we mean is that there's this dynamic relationship. In other words, past observations can affect future observations. And really, in, in some sense, you know, future observations can affect present observations through expectations um, and our expectation formation. All right, and so um, that's that's really important to, to keep in mind when we're dealing with time series and when that dynamic relationship exists, that's when that natural ordering over time just has to be preserved because if we don't, then we destroy that, that relationship. So if I think about this, I can kind of visualize this whole effect that's going on. So if I have an economic action, something that happens at time period t. There's an effect in time period t. There's an instantaneous effect, but then there's an effect that happens a little bit later, an effect that happens a little bit after that. So we can think about this like, for example, um, say we have a monetary policy shock. All right, so the, the Federal Reserve comes out and um, announces that they're going to change monetary policy. Okay, well, the first thing that that happens is a news cycle effect because they come out and make the announcement and no change has actually happened yet other than the announcement has happened. But then the economy reacts to that. So participants in the economy, oftentimes we just call that the market, all right, reacts to that announcement that that new news is happening that the Fed is going to do something, all right? That's that immediate effect. There's a whole literature on this called the news cycle effect. Um, and so that could be that immediate effect. Then a little bit later, we actually see the policy implemented. Okay, so it takes a little bit for that policy to get implemented, and then we see this come kind of some of that immediate effect of that implementation. And then, well, even after it actually happens, it doesn't completely filter out to the rest of the economy just instantly. It takes a little time for it to that shock to propagate. Um, and so we have further effects happening even later. So that's what we mean about these things having these dynamic effects. So it has an effect on different time periods. The other thing that we can have in here is that this effect itself that happens here may also have an effect here. And then this effect may have an effect in a later time period. So the effect itself may have some effects. So I mean, we've got effects going on all over the place, which just basically means time series analysis can be really, really complicated if we're not, and we have to be very, very careful in how we model it. So one really big challenge, I'm, I'm not even sure I should call this the first big challenge, but a big challenge that we have to do is we have this assumption from classical linear regression that the covariance, all right, or the variance between observations, and and this here, that's just, I, I wouldn't worry about that. That's just kind of math that comes out that those two covariances should be the same. Um, well, those should equal zero. In other words, we shouldn't see a relationship between different observations, all right? You shouldn't see a covariance between those, those. well, if we have a dynamic structure, well, that just blew that out of the water, right? We just said, all right, let me get rid of my scribbles. We just said, hey, look, that this, this thing that happens here might have 
effects here, here, and here, and the effects themselves might have some effects. So, I mean, we have totally blown that um, this assumption right here out of the water, right, right before we buy. So, the, if there's a dynamics in this series, well, we don't have that. Um, and so we've got to be careful. We've got to deal with that. Um, so another big challenge that we have is something called covariance stationarity. All right. So what we want to do is we want the moments of this series or the, you know, the things like the mean and the standard deviation. We want them to be constant over time. We don't want them to be changing over time because if they start changing over time, well, then, well, we kind of lose, you know, basically the stability of our relationships that we find. The relationships we find don't matter because they, they only work for the sample that we looked at, right? And so I'm going to show you three, four different um, types of series here. Um, and they, they all have a different, what we call data generating process. So the data generating process or the, um, I'm going to write it over here data generating process, DGP, is what I like to think of it is, is this is box, all right? And you can think of it like nature. All right, so this is the world, this is nature, this is the market, this is all the stuff, and we put all this stuff in, and that's how we get our observation of our data comes out of that. And for some reason, all of that stuff gets shaken up into that data generating process, and that creates our observation of the data that we see. Um, so, you know, we take all the economic activity, the imports, the exports, the production, the labor, the everything that goes on with the, in the, the economy, we shake it all up for a quarter. Well, hopefully we don't shake it too much. That would be an earthquake and that would be bad. But all right, we shake it up for a quarter and out comes real GDP, all right? And there's a data generating process there. Well, in this case, my data generating process for these four different series is a whole lot simpler. It's basically a, a random number generator that I'm pulling, pushing through a, um, a particular formula. Um, and in each case, um, I generate a series of random errors that are normally distributed just through a random number generator and spit that through a formula and get four different series. And the first one is stationary. And so it's going to look something like, you know, you know, yt equals, um, yeah, I think it was 0.5 yt minus one plus et, something like that, where et is normally distributed. Nothing too fancy. OK, but notice that guy is less than one, which means shocks or changes past observations. There is dynamics to it because a past observation does affect the present, but it doesn't do it forever. All right. It dies out. And that's a big deal. All right. We need those shocks to eventually die out and we see, OK, that's what's going on here. It did. You know, I have a big shock, but then it comes back up and it comes up and it's it's really rooted to that mean. So it kind of has this mean reverting type behavior. You know, maybe I have a low shock, but then I'm equally likely to have a high shock and it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we can see, you know, over the course of this series, the standard deviation, you know, the spread of the data is pretty even. All right. The mean stays constant pretty well. Um, and it just kind of goes back and forth. That's a stationary series. OK, this is the easy one to deal with. And what we're dealing with here in Chapter 9, um, the world doesn't work that way. I mean, almost no series in the world are like that. So let's look at a few other ones. Here is a standard non-stationary series. So the difference between you know V1 and V2 is this. V1 is something like YT or V whatever you want. I'm calling this Y. Um, equals 0 0.5 yt minus 1 plus et. And no, et is not phoning home. Um, all right, so we have in the non stationary, we have yt equals 1 times yt minus 1 
Oh, and that's that's bad notation here. Let me. Up. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Here, let me write this round. Y t equals zero point five. Y t minus one plus e t. This one's going to be y t equals one times y t minus one. There, I got it as a subscript plus e t. All right, what's the difference here? Here, this coefficient on y t minus one is less than one. All right, its absolute value, to be more specific, is less than one. And so the effects of a change in y t minus one die out over time. Here, it's one. So when I go forward to y, if I update this to yt plus 1, yt minus 1 is still in there. Go up to another period, still there, still there, still there. It never goes away. All right. And as a result, we get this non-stationarity, and we'll get different kinds of behavior. So essentially, what you do is you get this kind of drunken walk, or um, it goes here, but then there's no real thing to push it back down. So maybe it goes here, then goes here, then goes here, then goes here, then goes here. All right. You can see different things. Now, in, in this particular graph, it looks like there's some pretty strong trend. And there can be some tendency to have trend within um, non-stationary data, um, or at least it look like there, but it doesn't have to. This is just one way. I just randomly did these. If I recompile these slides, um, it'll generate a new set of random numbers, and I'll get a different series that could look very differently. How do you tell this? Well, a couple of good exercises to do, one of which is just create you know, a plot of a non-stationary series that is you know, a random number generator, and just look at a whole bunch of them. And you start to kind of see. You kind of can compare them a little bit. But to be honest, we really need to do testing for this. It's hard. It's it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a series that's like this, a series that's like this, um, in in with real life data. So um, we'll talk about testing in well the next chapter. All right, the next one here is random walk with drift. And so with this one, we have yt. It's going to be just like this one. All right, just like the non-stationary, only we've got a constant in there. So you've got yt equals some delta plus 1 yt minus 1 plus epsilon t. And that's a random walk with drift. All right, and so you could think of it like this. So if this is a drunk kind of walking down the beach, all right, you know, could be, you know, just all over the place. They're a little bit all over the place, but there is a relationship to the previous step Right. If I look at their footsteps walking down the beach, each next footstep is completely random. But there is some some pattern to it because their feet are connected to one another. And so while the um, next footfall is going to be random, it's going to be within a field that's you know reasonably close to the last footstep because well they're connected, right? The body's you know one piece. It's not in multiple pieces. Um, this one. Think about it like this, you know, it's a drunken walk, but they're listing off to one side, right? They, you know, they have a tendency to go one direction or another, and delta could be positive or negative, all right? And so you get um, a kind of trend. In this one, you will get trend because of that delta. Now, here's the thing about it. This is what's called a stochastic trend, or we use this a ton in economics. Um, this is not quite the same as putting time in there, where we have like a deterministic trend. So you just add time in as a trend term. It's not quite the same as that. In fact, that's what this one is. And so what I have here in this trend stationary is I have a deterministic trend, which the way I would put that is I have yt equals some function of time. So we'll call that beta 0 times time plus, all right, in this case, it was 0 0.5 yt minus 1, because that part's stationary, plus my epsilon t. And what I have here is if I draw that trend line through here and I subtract that trend off, what I have left going around that trend will be a stationary series. 
or at least it's supposed to be the way I the way I simulate it. All right, and that's that's another type that's that's kind of common to see. Well, at least we talk about a lot is something that's trend stationary. So those are four really big types. These are not by any stretch of the imagination the only types of time series you'll see and the only types of behavior you'll see. Um, but they are four pretty common ones that you probably better know about. All right, so let's stop talking about this and let's start doing some examples. Um, so we're going to talk about an example. This is what's called Oaken's Law. Now, Arthur Oaken came up with, um, it really it should be called Arthur Oaken's Empirical Regularity because it's, it's not necessarily what we call a law like you'd see as a law in physics. Um, but they basically found a relationship between unemployment, all right, and changes in the unemployment rate and deviation from um, our natural rate of um, GDP or potential GDP. That's, that's basically, in a nutshell, what Oaken's Law is all about. Um, I don't want to get necessarily into the macroeconomic theory weeds on this one. Um, it's just an example. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this formulation where we have the change in the unemployment rate. Right, so that's a change in rates. So it's a difference between two unemployment rates, not total unemployment, but the unemployment rate. And the difference between the growth rate, the actual growth rate of GDP, and the natural growth rate of GDP. And if we do a whole bunch of fancy macro theory and um, um, algebra, we could rewrite that something like this. Okay, um, and we have all this stuff. I'll let you guys think about the um, algebra on the macro on th that, um, but we can then step back and say, okay, we could estimate a model very much in the spirit of Oaken's Law by regressing the first difference of the unemployment rate on GDP growth and lags of GDP growth and get at that, uh, some of that dynamic relationship, okay? Let's keep going. So let's figure out how we're gonna estimate this in R. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here and we're gonna load the data. And yep, I've gotten a little bit lazy here. I'm gonna use the package that's provided with the textbook to load the data, but we could also export into a CSV file and use read.csv or find the R files that are available and um, import it using that. There's lots of different ways we can get the data in, but we've talked about that before, so we're not going to worry about that now. Um, and now, though, I'm going to take this part, which brings this in as a data frame. And I'm going to convert it to a time series. And so we're using, we're going to be using a couple of packages in, um, um, this um, chapter. One of them is Zoo. I don't know where the name came from, but what the heck, it sounds like fun. Um, Zoo handles a lot of things to do with time series. And we're going to use this uh, dynamic LM package, which also does some cool stuff for time series. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this Oaken, which is a data frame, and convert it into a time series or basically a data frame, a special data frame that is set up to know it's a time series. And what's different about that is we're gonna have a start date and an end date. So here we have the year and the period. All right, this is, and then we have the frequency. The frequency is four, so this is quarterly data. And so this is gonna be, this data set starts in 1985, quarter two and we'll end in 2009, quarter three. And we're basically going to pass to start and end a vector that has um, each part of the periods. And I believe what um, the, the things that time series can handle will be quarterly, monthly, and annually. It may do some more, I'm not sure, but I don't care at this point. We're dealing with quarterly, monthly, and annually. Um, at least this chapter and next. Okay, the next thing is we're going to load the dynamic LM model or um, package, 
and that gives us this dynamic LM function. Now, what's nice about that is it's just like LM, only it has some extra tools for handling the dynamic nature of time series. And so one of these tools is this cool lag function. All right, if you know anything about, if you've done anything with like, um, well, this is your first econometrics class, so you haven't. But if you've done any more econometrics class, which you haven't, because this is your first one, um, you would know what the, the lag operator is. All right, so I put L in front of G, and you know, so L in front of GT, that equals um, GT minus one, right? It just lags things. Well, that's kind of what this does. All right, it's a lag function. And what's really nice about this is I can give it a vector. In this case, I did a series, all right? So zero, one, two, three, and that tells us what lags to do. So lag zero, if I don't lag it at all, I lag at zero periods, I just get G back. So that would be G sub T. One would be G sub T minus one, two would be G sub T minus three, and it's, and it's minus. So you could also do leads by doing negatives. So, you know, if you started out and you went from negative one, two, three, you would end up with negative one, zero, one, two, three. And so you'd get one period in the future, zero period, one period in the past, one period. And you say, well, why would you use leads? That seems weird. Well, we don't very often, but there are some models that do. Um, and so it, it is in there. Um, we're not going to talk about those just yet. And then finally, we're going to run we're going to do a summary of that model. We can still use sum. Um, we're going to have to be a little bit careful, though, with this robust um, argument. It's not wrong to use the robust argument, but the robust argument is going to do this with respect to um, heteroscedasticity. It's not necessarily going to be the right one for time series. So we got to be careful with this. To be honest, we're going to be leaving JTools behind. Um, and not using this sum function very much longer um, because it just doesn't quite do time series right, um, at least in my opinion. And I'm going to show you how we do that just a little bit better um, in subsequence. But here's our estimation. Um, we're going we're gonna to ignore this for right now because we're going to do that better in just a little bit. But here is my intercept. Here is G, um, so this is um, GT, GT minus one, GT minus two, and GT minus three. All right, I can't write small enough to put that in there, but there you go, okay? So let's keep moving. Now let's do a little bit of analysis of what we've done. I can still use my plot.time function um, I need to update this plot.time to actually put in the um, periods rather than just the observation numbers, but for now it works. And overall, that looks like a pretty good fit. Now, I really like this plot. I think it's important to use a plot like this because it tells it, it's, it's very intuitive. You've got the red line. All right, let me just make it bigger. All right, you've got the red line, which is your fitted values. You've got the blue line, which is your actual values. And you can see, yeah, it kind of tracks it reasonably well. Um, you know, that that's very, very intuitive. Um, this probably isn't sufficient, though. Okay, it's a good thing to look at. It's just not the only thing you should look at if I'm going to evaluate whether or not we've got a good model or not. Another thing I want to look at is this residuals versus fits. Um, and in here, I see a few things. One, I don't, whenever I start seeing straight lines, I get nervous. Any kind of straight line just makes me nervous. I, I have to tell you, I'm always wondering, uh, is something wrong? Am I doing something wrong? Because um, straight, you know, there are no straight lines in the real world. I also see maybe there's something going on like this. So we probably better check things out a little bit more. Okay. Um, I would, I would probably, I'm not going to say this is a bad model. It actually looks like it's got a pretty good fit. Um, but this tells me I want to investigate maybe just a smidgen more. 